Support for today's episode of Evidence Locker comes from Noom, helping people around the world enjoy healthier lives through better nutrition and exercise. You don't have to change it all in one day. Small steps make big progress. Sign up for your trial today at noom.com forward slash evidence. You are listening to The Evidence Locker. Our cases have been researched using open source and archived materials. It deals with true crimes and real people. Some parts are graphic in nature, and listener discretion is advised. Each episode is produced with the utmost respect to the victims, their families, and loved ones. On Sunday, the 9th of August, 2009, a resident living in a council housing complex on Victoria Street, Ipswich, noticed something strange. In his neighbor's window, a bunch of large, black flies were crowding. He had never seen that before. That in itself was perhaps not cause for concern. But the apartment of Rosalind Rosie Hunt was unusually quiet that morning. Rosie had many homeless friends and often spent time with them, drinking and smoking. He had also heard some screams coming from Rosie's place in the days before. Police came, but they didn't seem to find anything suspicious. The neighbor had not physically seen Rosie for a couple of days and thought it would be prudent to call police again so they could conduct a welfare check. On entering the premises that morning, the officers found Rosie's body on a mattress in her bedroom. Initial indications suggested that she was in the early stages of decomposition and had been violently assaulted. Although Rosie lived in a harsh environment, she was well-liked and had many friends. Her death shocked the community, and members of the street-drinking crowd of Ipswich decided to come forward to tell police a chilling story. Desmond Thorpe, 43 years old, originally from Norfolk, had met and married Deborah, and together they had four children, of which Lorraine Thorpe was one. The family seemed happy for a while, living at Clapgate Lane in the south of Ipswich. Perhaps not the best of areas to raise a family due to the high crime rate. But in their little corner, the Thorpes were doing okay. Growing up, Lorraine was quite a handful. With guidance from teachers, her parents had her tested and she was diagnosed with Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or ADHD. With the diagnosis came prescription drugs, and soon, the always-smiling Lorraine was much better. But just as she was about to enter her teens, life as she knew it changed forever. Over the years, Des and Deborah's marriage had deteriorated. Both of them drank excessively, and their home life became unbearable. So in 2006, when Lorraine was 12 years old, they decided to separate. Ipswich Social Services intervened, and Lorraine was placed in foster care. After a while, she moved back in with her mother, but this didn't quite work out. She had always preferred her dad over her mom and went looking for Des. At this stage, Lorraine made sure she remained close to her dad and wanted to spend as much time with him as possible. Sadly, after separating from Deborah, Des found himself in a downward spiral. He had fallen into alcoholism, and in the space of two years, he was in a bad way. Des was a chronic alcoholic and was incapable of looking after himself or functioning to some degree without a regular intake of booze. He was unable to tend to his own personal hygiene and toileting needs, and he wasn't even the shadow of the man he used to be. Because of Des's alcoholism, he spent all of his time with Ipswich's drinking community. He hardly ever had a place to stay and slept rough on the streets. He occasionally found shelter in the squalid flat of a drinking buddy and Lorraine decided to give up the comforts of home to be with her dad. She loved him and wanted to care for him, but that meant that she often had to sleep out on the streets with him. Social services found her and placed her in foster homes over time, but she always ran away. Lorraine became adept at hiding from social workers, and in the years that followed, she spent more time on the streets than anywhere else. Lorraine's childhood pretty much ended with her parents' separation. She did not go to school anymore, and she had no friends. She gave it all up to become Dez's full-time caregiver. 
Eventually, Des became so incapacitated due to his consumption of large amounts of alcohol that he could barely walk. Certainly not unaided, continually needing the assistance of someone to lean on. By 2009, that someone was 15-year-old Lorraine. It was through her father that Lorraine also became involved with the street drinking community. By all accounts, it would seem that Lorraine had had very little care, compassion, and love in her life. And within the crowd of social outcasts, she felt a sense of belonging. But it was far from the ideal environment for an impressionable young girl. She witnessed constant drinking, drug use, stealing and fighting, everything parents typically try to protect their children from. But Des was too far gone, and his own self-destructive behavior was heartbreaking to witness. He was quite weak and a soft target for the bullies in the group. Lorraine met dangerous and aggressive people, like John Grimwood, a longtime substance abuser, and leader of the pack, 41-year-old ex-military man Paul Clark. Paul had a soft spot for Lorraine and stepped in to protect her if others hassled her. This was something her own father was incapable of doing. Having become a child of the local social care system, rejected by her mother as it would appear to her, and then becoming a crutch for her father's chronic alcoholism, it is little wonder that she latched on to the first person that showed her some interest. Lorraine most likely enjoyed the attention she was getting from Paul, and in some ways must have been impressed that someone so high up in the street hierarchy was paying attention to her. Paul was proud of his military background and had an explosive angry streak. During an interview for the production of Murder Town, Brian Tobin, who set up a charity to help some of the Ipswich Street drinkers get back on their feet, stated, I first came into contact with Paul Clark in 2008. You could sense the aggression. You could see that he was always the leader, if you like. And from what I know of Paul, I think he would have led by fear, intimidation, and violence. He was a very dangerous individual, and I always thought that in 2008 when I met him. But not everyone in the crowd was as notorious and aggressive as Paul. Rosalind Hunt was a 41-year-old mother of two, with a kind and caring nature. By 2009, Rosie had separated from her husband, who kept custody of their children. She was living alone in a council-owned flat at 87 Victoria Street, Ipswich. Rosie, a chronic alcoholic, soon became a member of the Ipswich drinking community, to which Lorraine and Des Thorpe belonged. Her brother, Adrian Provins, remembered a Rosie from happier times. He said, Rosalind was my youngest sister. What I remember about Rosie, growing up as a little girl, was she was always playful and that, you know, a cheerful little kid. Used to bump off school a lot. Her and my other sister would always find a derelict house and sort of like, you know, pretend that it was theirs, put furniture in it. Where they got the furniture from is beyond me, but they'd put curtains up and pretend that it was their little house. From family members' accounts, she was known to have loved animals and dreamed of becoming a vet, an ambition that would not be realized as she was continually skipping school. She was also described by a family member as being someone who found it difficult to socialize with other members of her own age group and was initially thought to be a bit of a loner. Sadly, her dreams of working with animals shifted further away when she found herself married with two children at the age of 18. Although she was a good mother to her son, her relationship with her daughter was strained, and the daughter eventually went to live with the grandmother. This broke Rosie's heart, and her slow descent into the oblivion provided by alcohol abuse began, and eventually, her marriage broke up. Rosie had a regular income, in that she was in receipt of state benefits, and she had her own council on flat. She was known by the drinking crowd to be a friendly lady. Rosie had remained close with her ex-husband despite their separation. He visited Rosie in July of 2009 and found about 10, or maybe more, of the Ipswich drinking community inside her flat. When he wanted to ask them to leave, Rosie had assured him that everything was okay. Within the crowd, some of the people had accommodation and access to money. The others quickly latched on and imposed on them. In Rosie's case, they definitely used her for what she had to offer. It would seem that at some stage the drinking group, which was dominated by Paul Clark, had begun using Rosie's flat as a drinking den, forcing her to cook for them and even going so far as to controlling what Rosie spent her money on. When Paul Clark spoke, everyone backed off. Police later established that Paul and Rosie may have dated for a while, but the exact nature of their relationship was never officially confirmed. Paul was dominant and ruthless. He also encouraged Lorraine Thorpe to start drinking at a young age. She was no longer taking her ADHD medication, and introducing alcohol was dangerous for her adolescent mind. But it was okay by Paul, 
so no one dared say anything. Des never said anything, and it was just the way it was. Lorraine saw herself as Paul's sidekick and felt untouchable. For the first time since her family broke up, she felt cared for. Paul had her back. The only person who didn't seem to be phased by Paul Clark's dictatorship was Rosie Hunt. Always the caregiver, she immediately recognized that the streets of Ipswich was an unsuitable environment for a young schoolgirl like Lorraine Thorpe. Rosie tried to help her as best she could, and they became good friends. Lorraine always had a place to crash at Rosie's, and Rosie protected her when she tried to hide from the group or even from authorities. Rosie was of the intention to inform Ipswich Social Services about Lorraine's circumstances, but if she ever had the chance to actually do so is unclear. We'll take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. Been an indulgent festive season for me for sure. And that, on the back of months of lockdown? <laughs> All I can say is this. I'm ready to start working on myself to feel better in 2022. At this point in the game, I've realized that I can be my own worst enemy when it comes to maintaining healthy habits. And I erred on the side of caution when it came to this year's resolutions. It would be great if, you know, for one year I actually keep up my good start. So with the help of Noom, I'm hoping not for a new year, new me, but rather a new year, new mindset. Noom's psychology-based approach will help me understand my habits a bit better. Why do I crave certain foods? Why do I lose motivation? Noom's easy-to-use app will help me stay on track with daily check-ins. If you go to noom.com forward slash evidence, you can sign up for a trial and see how it all works. It's super convenient, and I can plan my day in 10 minutes right on my phone. I set the pace and determine how drastically I'm prepared to change my lifestyle. By swapping some of my vices out for healthier options, I'm positive that I will learn sustainable behavior that will serve me better. I'm always wary of fad diets and expensive supplements. But with Noom, I can do what I know works for me and improve on it by understanding the psychology behind eating better. My focus will shift to the why instead of the what in order to change my relationship with food. With Noom, no food is completely off limits. I can keep eating foods I enjoy, all the while learning to maintain a healthier balance. I'm excited about this new journey, and I'm looking forward to sharing my story with you. If you want to join me on this quest to be a healthier me, and lose the weight for good? Sign up for your trial today at noom.com forward slash evidence. That's N-O-O-M dot com forward slash evidence. Now, back to today's episode. One blissful Sunday afternoon in early August 2009, Rosie's peace was disturbed when the crowd poured into her apartment. She knew better than to fight it, but felt that she needed to get out. So it came that Rosie took Paul Clark's Pitbull staffing mix for a walk into Ipswich Town Center. The dog, like its owner, was aggressive and unruly. It lunged at a toddler. Eyewitness accounts vary, but it was alleged that Rosie either yanked the dog chain or kicked the dog in an attempt to stop it from biting the child. With many eyes and ears on the street, the incident was related to Paul Clark that same night. Rosie was tipped off that Paul knew she had kicked his dog and was afraid of what might happen to her. Fearing for her safety and too afraid to return to her own flat where everyone was still drinking, Rosie went to stay with Des Thorpe, Lorraine's father. At the time, Des stayed in an apartment on Limerick Close, about 1.8 miles from her place. Lorraine Thorpe found Rosie there and convinced her that everything was okay, and Paul wasn't angry. He understood she did what had to be done in the situation. Lorraine put Rosie at ease and said that it was okay to return home. She could even go with her and visit Paul at his flat in Mountbatten Court and see for herself. Rosie, who loved animals and would never harm one, was relieved that Paul had faith in her. The story had been blown out of proportion, and Rosie knew in her heart of hearts she saved the child and did not hurt the dog. She then left with Lorraine. In the week that followed, no one saw Rosie around. It was only on the morning of Sunday, August 9th, when her neighbor reported a concern for Rosalind's welfare to police. Police forced their way into her flat and found her badly bruised and battered body in the bedroom. News of Rosie's death spread like wildfire through the streets of Ipswich. Everyone was talking about it, and it was hard to believe that she was gone. Rosie was one of the kindest, most generous people, and the general feeling was that she was taken too soon. But as discussions about her death floated around, on the same day her body was discovered, both Paul Clark and young Lorraine Thorpe were heard bragging to friends about how they had killed Rosie. This was unacceptable, and Rosie's friends were furious. 
When Desthorpe overheard his daughter and Paul boasting and laughing about torturing and killing Rosie, he lost it and threatened to go to the police. However, his friends knew he would never turn his daughter in, and they thought he just wanted to scare them. Besides, Des, crippled by his alcohol abuse, could barely walk to the toilet, let alone report a crime. This moment of clarity and attempted parenting from Des was sadly too little, too late. Lorraine had already lost all respect for him and found a new father figure in Paul. In the early hours of Monday, August 10, 2009, the owner of the flat on Limerick Close returned to find the lifeless body of Desmond Thorpe lying on his couch. The owner immediately called emergency services. Paramedics were at the scene within minutes, but there was nothing they could do for Des. He was pronounced dead at the scene, and police were called out. First responding officers noted that Des had blood around his mouth and many other injuries. Because of alcoholism, they could not exclude the possibility that he had died due to natural causes. But the fact that Des died one day after one of his friends turned up dead immediately made investigators suspicious. It didn't take police long to learn about the talk on the street, that Paul Clark and Lorraine Thorpe were going around telling everyone that they had killed Rosie and that Des had threatened to report them to police. So on the morning of Monday, August 10, 2009, Paul Clark was located on a street nearby, arrested and taken to Ipswich Police Station. Lorraine Thorpe was traced to her mother's address in town and was also arrested. Both Lorraine and Paul were interviewed under caution by Ipswich Police. Lorraine denied any involvement in her father's death. Her behavior was erratic, and she giggled while she was being questioned. To police, it was clear that she did not grasp or respect the seriousness of her situation. During her interview, Lorraine let something slip. She said, You'll find my footprint on my dad. And that they did. On Dez's forehead was a print made by a sneaker, Lorraine's sneaker. Pressure marks from teeth on the inside of his lips were consistent with an excessive external pressure being applied. Punch and kick marks on various parts of his body indicated that Dez had been severely beaten. 15-year-old Lorraine was already boasting about killing Rosie Hunt to friends. But surely, she could not have murdered her own father in such a brutal fashion. She loved him and gave up her life to look after him. On searching outside the premises of Dez's flat, crime scene officers found a pillow that had bloodstains on it. The blood was later confirmed to be that of Desmond Thorpe. He had been suffocated. Meanwhile, Rosie's autopsy revealed the horrors of her last days alive. From police evidence in the coroner's report, it was established that Rosie had been systematically tortured over a period of days. The official cause of death was deemed to be blunt force trauma. As the pieces of the puzzle came together, investigators were able to construct a timeline of events leading up to Rosie and Dez's deaths. Firstly, Rosie was right to be afraid of Paul after the incident with his dog. He was furious and felt Rosie shouldn't get away with wrangling his dog. He sent Lorraine to Dez's place to smooth things over with Rosie and lure her into a trap. Good-hearted Rosie was relieved that Paul was supposedly not mad at her. She trusted Lorraine, who had become like a daughter to her. She left Dez's place with Lorraine and was a lamb to the slaughter. In the days that followed... Rosie was held against her will at Paul's council housing unit in Mountbatten Court. Paul unleashed his full rage onto Rosie, while Lorraine was an all-too-willing participant. By some accounts, Lorraine even enjoyed hurting her friend. The torture Rosie suffered was unthinkable. They sliced the left side of her face with a cheese grater, then rubbed table salt into the raw wounds. She was severely kicked, punched, and slapped with injuries mainly inflicted onto her torso. To make his point about Rosie being rough with his dog, Paul used a dog chain and hit her repeatedly. In the end, Rosie had nine broken ribs, a broken hyoid bone, multiple strangulation marks, and it was evident that her hair had been set on fire. Witnesses told police that they heard Paul and Lorraine bragging about the mental torture they inflicted as well. Rosie was threatened with an electric fan which had had its guard removed, and they moved it within clipping distance of her face. She was also forced to get into a suitcase, which was then zipped up for an undisclosed period of time. On the afternoon of Tuesday, August 4, 2009, as witnessed by neighbors, both Paul Clark and Lorraine Thorpe walked Rosalind back to her flat at 87 Victoria Street, where the abuse continued. Having heard the commotion, a neighbor called the police, on arrival, the police knocked on the door. 
However, as there was no reply, they left. It was later determined that Rosie was probably still alive when the officers called at her place. But she was badly injured, mutilated, and most likely unable to move or call out. She must have been so desperate for help, and when they left, all hope was lost. This police blunder became a contentious issue, and action was taken against the officers responsible. Had they persisted, who knows? They may have been able to save Rosie. Around the 4th of August, the exact date is unknown, but Lorraine and Paul left the small apartment on Victoria Street, and then later returned with some sleeping pills, and forced Rosalind to swallow them. Their plan was to make Rosie's death look like suicide. But she had so many injuries, how they thought they'd get away with it is anyone's guess. On the morning of August 9th, 2009, a week after Rosie was last seen, a neighbor who had noted a massing of flies on a window of her flat called the police. When police attended enforced entry, they found Rosie's body on a mattress in her bedroom, seemingly assaulted and with early signs of decomposition. The next morning, police heard of yet another death, this time of Lorraine Thorpe's own father, Dez did not suffer the same prolonged degree of torture as Rosie, but his was by far not a swift and painless death either. He was kicked, punched, stomped on, and finally suffocated. He was physically frail and would not have been able to defend himself against the unforgiving onslaught. Both Paul and Lorraine were subsequently charged with two accounts of murder, that of Rosalind Hunt and Desmond Thorpe. Investigators brought in social workers to help them in figuring out the relationship between Paul and Lorraine. If it was in any way romantic, Paul had more charges coming his way, seeing as Lorraine was only a minor. Both of them vehemently denied ever having a physical relationship, and there was no evidence to prove otherwise. However, their relationship was a close one. They spent all of their time together and wreaked havoc. The trial that had the country's attention commenced in July of 2010. Paul Clark and Lorraine Thorpe both pleaded not guilty on both accounts of murder. Because they had both regularly been present at both crime scenes previous to the murders, forensic evidence was of little use, and in this case the best evidence was obtained from witnesses. John Grimwood was a local resident of Ipswich, and his extended family still lived in the local area. At an early age, he had fallen into the world of drugs and alcohol. His reputation preceded him somewhat, and the group of drinkers were wary of him as he had a tendency towards violence. John was present at both of the addresses leading up to the murders and afterwards, too. Police have statements from witnesses stating that John also committed acts of violence against Rosie during her ordeal. During the course of seven weeks, the jury were required to consider the best evidence from drug addicts, alcoholics, and people with personality disorders, making for a difficult case to prove. Throughout the trial, Lorraine Thorpe was observed to be continually laughing and joking with Paul Clark. She was noted to be looking around the courtroom and smiling at people with intermittent bursts of giggling. Because of her ADHD, the judge allowed frequent breaks, and the trial struggled to gain momentum. Only once the case was presented in court did the public learn just how violent and sadistic Paul and Lorraine had been. As the trial progressed, the details of the assaults and murders of Rosie and Dez were described to a horrified courtroom, and the level of violence depicted shocked the public gallery. Lorraine did not give evidence at the trial, and in fact, denied being at either of the addresses or present during the murders. But one witness testified to hearing both Lorraine and Paul shouting at Rosie, We're going to kill you! We're going to kill you! The defense offered by Graham Charles Parkins QC was that Paul was angry because Rosie had reportedly kicked his dog. However, there was no proof that Rosie actually kicked the dog. She was known to love animals, and given the situation, she probably only tried to keep the dog away from the toddler. Psychologists believe the motive for killing Rosie was far greater. The prosecution, Patricia Lynch QC, proposed that the attack had occurred because Rosie was going to report her concerns about Lorraine to child welfare, and it was fear of this, and the possible ending of Paul and Lorraine's relationship, whatever that was, that in fact motivated the pair to murder Rosalind and Desmond. To demonstrate this possible motive, the court was provided with evidence that the police had attended Rosie's property on Wednesday, the 17th of June, 2009, looking for Lorraine. Paul Clark was said to be very annoyed that the police even knew that Lorraine had been staying with Rosie and blamed Rosie for telling social services where Lorraine was. Lorraine had been briefly taken into care at this point. However, she quickly absconded yet again. With regards to Des, 
Both Lorraine and Paul claimed that being drunk, he must have choked on his own vomit while sleeping. But medical evidence was provided to the court that support the fact that Dez was smothered. And the pillow with his blood that was discarded outside his flat was most likely used to suffocate him. Throughout the trial, Paul Clark showed no remorse and insisted he never killed anyone. Then, he even tried to pin it all on Lorraine, but no one bought it. They both played their part. Lorraine was not intimidated or forced by Clark, but he was not influenced by her either. Admitting to his role to some degree, he finally said that Lorraine had instigated the attack. People were shocked to learn about Lorraine's ruthless behavior, but everyone knew that Paul was just as guilty as she was. Mitigating circumstances existed with Lorraine in that she had previously been diagnosed with ADHD, symptoms of which should have been controlled by her medication, which she had stopped taking. The result of which would have had the effect of increasing the outward symptoms, irritability, lack of attention, inability to think clearly. She was responsible for protracted kicking, punching, and stamping on Rosalind, who was not fit to defend herself effectively from the outset. Far from being sorry, Lorraine appears to have gloried in it, describing to her friends at one stage how she stamped on Rosalind's head. When referring to Dez's death, Judge Saunders stated that, the only possible explanation can be the fear that he would go and tell the police what happened to Rosalind Hunt. I don't accept that Lorraine Thorpe was entirely under the control of Mr. Clark. She is someone who can be quite stubborn and willful and is capable of being highly manipulative herself. Her story is an appalling one. The jury retired for 17 hours and came back with four guilty verdicts. Paul Clark was found guilty of the murders of Rosalind Hunt and Desmond Thorpe, as was Lorraine Thorpe. John Grimwood was found not guilty on both counts. At the time, Lorraine Thorpe was Britain's youngest female double murderer. Unfortunately, this sordid story does not end here. To police, there was no doubt whatsoever that John had been present and involved in the torture and murder of Rosalind. However, he was eventually acquitted of all charges due to a lack of evidence. John very quickly established himself back into the street drinking community of Ipswich, and despite having been cleared of the crime, he boasted of his knowledge and involvement in the murder of both Rosie and Dez. With Paul Clark in prison, someone needed to take the position of the top dog, and John felt that the position was reserved just for him. Within one year after his release, John murdered his then-girlfriend and attempted to stab one of her friends to death. John had been abusing his partner, Allison Studd, for months. One day, an argument about tobacco caused him to crawl underneath the kitchen table and cut her leg. He severed a main artery, and Allison realized she was in trouble. She left the apartment and collapsed on the street. She later died in the hospital due to blood loss. Grimwood was found guilty this time, and is currently imprisoned in HMP Whitemore Maximum Security Prison, together with Lorraine Thorpe. Paul Clark imploded in prison and decided to take his own life. His body was found in a cell at Whitemore, with a ligature around his neck, on September 1, 2014. He had only served five years of his prison sentence. Lorraine Thorpe will be eligible for parole on the 9th of March, 2024. She will still be in her 20s, her life ahead of her. However, the judge made it clear that she would only be released if she is deemed to pose no danger to society. The million dollar question is, could these murders have been prevented? Who knows? Paul Clark was a ticking time bomb, fueling his aggressive and dangerous nature with alcohol abuse. Perhaps he would have snapped and killed Rosie or someone else even, whether Lorraine was by his side or not. As for Lorraine, she had no control in her life ever. In torturing Rosie and then killing her father, she was finally in control. Hers is a sad story of a neglected child who needed love and instead got a life of delinquency handed to her in a bottle wrapped in a brown paper bag. If you'd like to read more about this case, have a look at the resources used for this episode in the show notes. Also visit us on social media to see more about today's case. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also check out our channel on YouTube. If you like what we do here at Evidence Locker, subscribe on Apple Podcast or wherever you are listening right now and kindly leave a five-star review. This was the Evidence Locker. Thank you for listening.